Oh, yeah. You got one. <laughs> no, what's your name? Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Professor Carolyn Reed. I'm the chair of the Professor of Faithful Science here at Hofstra University. And I wanted to welcome you all to what is now our second installment of a series that is entitled Interrogating Hate anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and racism in the European Union and at home. This event is sponsored by Hofstra's European Studies Program, and for all of you uh, in the room, we do have a minor in European Studies, and if you are interested in doing that interdisciplinary minor, please do come and see me or contact me. And this is also supported by the European Union, through an Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet grant. So today's talk is entitled The Challenge of Islamophobia in Europe. And this talk is, as I've already mentioned, part of a grant. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the grant. It's a three-year grant. Um, this is money coming from the European Union, and it is meant to infuse our curriculum with European Union content and specifically around this theme of anti-discrimination and hate crime policy in the European Union. And you can look forward to, in spring 23, one of the courses that will be part of the grant that will be um, including this European Union uh, content is a course that is cross-listed across Jewish studies, religion, and the Latin American Caribbean Studies program. And the course is entitled Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia and Racism, Global Perspectives, and this will be taught by Professor Slabotsky. So if you are interested in this and want to continue studying this, that would be a great class to register for for spring. Um, we'll also be having a couple events associated with the Obama Conference. Um, we'll be sending a group of students as part of the SUNY Model EU program this coming spring, which will take place in, uh, in uh, New York City. Um, we are taking students to Washington, D.C. very soon, in two weeks, and we will be visiting the European Parliament Liaison Office and the Commission delegation as well. And then there are more speaker series to come, so keep your eye out for uh, more parts of the grant and, and this program. So I want to do a few thank yous, because none of this is possible without a lot of help and a lot of support. And so I really want to thank the Cultural Center for helping to put this all together. The space, all the technology in here, the beautiful posters that they made. I want to thank Ashton Collins in the back, Carol Mallison, who's also in the back, um, and Jimmy Rinaldi as well, who's also in the back, manning, manning the doors and making sure everybody gets in. So I want to thank them. I also want to thank the Hofstra College of Arts and Sciences Interim Dean, Daniel Siebel, for all of his support um, in the, both the grant and facilitating these kinds of events. I also want to thank Hofstra's Office for Research and Sponsored Program. Um, they were instrumental in um, helping us acquire the grant. I also want to thank the faculty who are participating in this program and helped put this event together today. Sally Charna, who's Chair and Professor of History, Paul Fritz from the Department of Political Science, and Santiago Slavotsky in the back. The Robert and Florence Kaufman Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies and Chair in Jewish Studies and Associate Professor of Religion. I also want to welcome, I'm so excited to have you all. We have two groups with us from Roslyn High School. We have the Muslim Discussion Group and the Diversity Club. So I'm thrilled that you came. So excited to have all of you. And Ms. Allen, thank you for bringing your class. It is such an honor to have you all here. I also want to thank my colleagues for bringing their classes as well. Um, Carrie Jensen in the back, and I think uh, Professor Pugliese, I can talk to him in the project class as well. So thank you for bringing classes. Just one final <clears throat> thing that I need to read. There is a disclaimer that I need to read as part of the grant, is that this is funded by the European Union. Views and opinions expressed are, however, those of the presenters only and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or Hofstra University. Neither the European Union nor Hofstra <coughs> excuse me, can be held responsible for them. 
And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, who we are very excited to have with us this morning. Farid Hafez, is, who has a PhD, is currently visiting professor of international studies at Williams College. Before, he was a lecturer and researcher at the University of Salzburg, Department of Political Science and Sociology. He is also a faculty member at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service, where he researches and writes about Islamophobia as a senior fellow for the Bridge Initiative. In 2017, he was a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, and in 2014, he was a Visiting Scholar at Columbia University of New York. Since 2010, he has been the editor of the Islamophobia Studies Yearbook, and since 2016, the co-editor of the European Islamophobia Report. Hafa serves as an advisor and reviewer for a number of boards and journals. He has received the Bruno Kresge Award for the Political Book of the Year for his anthology, Islamophobia in Austria, which is co-edited with John Wenzel. Currently, his research focuses on Muslim youth movements in Europe. He earned his PhD in political science from the University of Vienna. His latest publications include The Rise of Global Islamophobia and the War on Terror, Coloniality, Race, and Islam, which was co-edited with Nabi Bakali, and Islamophobia in Muslim Majority Societies with Anis um, Bayerkali. Hafez has published more than 100 scholarly articles, books, and policy papers. So we are so pleased to have you. And without further ado, Professor Hafez. Well, thank you so much for having me here, uh, Carolyn, um, and for this uh, nice introduction and uh, welcoming words. It's so glad to see so many of all of you here and to see that so many people have collaborated to make this event possible. Uh, also send thank you, Santiago, for reaching out um, in terms of the topic, and it's really um, a, a very pleasant uh, possibility for me to speak about some of the Europe while I'm here in the United States, um, given that I think there is really a lot going on and a lot of differences that we are uh, seeing, especially within the last few years, of what has been going on when we talk about Islamophobia across the Atlantic. Now, if I would speak about the challenge of Islamophobia, I think it could take me like a week or more, and uh, I would not stop talking. Um, so what I will try to do is basically um, really only to contribute by addressing a few aspects and, um, and trying to introduce a few ideas uh, speak a bit about the European uh, institutional level, which I think is really at the core of this research project. But uh, I will definitely not be able to cover a lot. Still, I, I hope that some of the things that I will bring up might uh, induce some kind of this kind of conversation, discussion, arguments uh, that will follow my short input. Um, before doing so, one of the things that I would like to start with is to speak very briefly about uh, what I mean when I talk and when I use this term Islamophobia, just to be on the same side of, of, of uh, in this conversation. Um, to put it very short, Islamophobia is basically anti-Muslim racism. Um, and I think it does not need so much um, argument uh, in a US context to explain that more in depth. Uh, still, at the very same time, what I have to say is that if you look into the academic literature, you will basically see three different theoretical approaches of how Islamophobia is understood. And the way that I put that is um, speaking about Islamophobia uh, through the lens of prejudice studies. That's uh, more on the institutional side of a lot of European countries, what you will find or the public debate, then there is Islamophobia understood as anti-Muslim racism, which is basically through the lens of racism and critical race studies, which is very much an American perspective. And the 
third one would be Islamophobia through the lens of post-colonial and decolonial studies. So I don't want to expand too much on that, but very shortly, I, I would paraphrase Edward Said in his work, uh, Orientalism, where he said um, about Orientalism, I think that very similar things can be said about uh, Islamophobia, uh, is to analyze um, the way of how European nation states, uh, well, this is going to be my perspective, at least here now, but how they deal with uh, Muslims by making statements about them, authorizing the use of Muslims, on Muslims, describing it, teaching it, and ultimately ruling over it. So it is a lot about power, which is at the heart of my understanding of Islamophobia. So I would define Islamophobia as a style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Muslim. And the rationality behind that is because Muslims are perceived as being a threat. So, especially if they have an independent political agency that goes along this identity and questions the power structures in those countries. So, Islamophobia, on the one hand, is a global phenomenon uh, rooted in the imagination of a white supremacy going as far back as 1492, um, the Reconquista within Europe start of the transatlantic slave trade within the Americas, uh, between the Americas and the colonized African continent. On the other hand, Islamophobia also knows different contextual manifestations following uh, especially the collapse of the Soviet Union and the introduction of the clash of civilization theory. Today, the religion line is what I would say again, the central marker of a difference of racist exclusion. See the Muslim ban that you had during the Trump administration, or if you look at China, the way the way how they established re-education camps, as the Chinese regime calls it, in Xinjiang. Now, in 1492, with the imagination of a pure white Christian continent following the Reconquista and the expulsion of Jews and Muslims, is a key moment in the making of the Muslim en enemy. Um, also an idea of a racialized Muslim other already appeared a few hundred years before with Pope Urban II during his speech on the Crusades. Still, it becomes a legitimate question as to what the situation of Muslims in Europe is today, especially given that Muslims are an increasing population uh, within uh, Europe. Um, which is much, much more than here in the United States. And what you can see here is the estimated uh, share of Muslims um, uh, among the uh, total population in 2016. Um, and you can see that in, in, in most parts of Western Europe, uh, that is around between seven and uh, three and seven percent of the whole population, uh, which is a much larger share compared to the United States. At the very same time, and these are three different scenarios as to how many Muslims will be in Europe in 2015 uh, by the Pew Research uh, Center, center uh, which basically has three different scenarios um, for the case of uh, zero, medium, and high migration of Muslim people into the European continent. And as you can see here, um, that does not really calculate the question of the fertility rate because other institutions have also calculated um, the scenarios of the share of Muslims in the European population if the fertility rate changes, stagnates, and, uh, and etc. But generally speaking, we can see that there is between the scenarios between seven, which I think is very little, and 20 to 25 percent especially after the influx of lots of refugees from the war, from war time Syria and Iraq, we can already see in some countries, we have already reached the 7%. Like Austria, where I come from, we speak of nearly 8 to 9% of the whole population in, this, uh, in, in 2022. So if we consider data 
uh, from comparative studies, uh, we can see that um, unfavorable views um, dominate the reputation of Muslims in Europe. And the interesting part of it is that this is especially the case in those places where the least Muslims live, such in the more eastern parts of Europe. Um, and you know, that goes hand in hand with something that every racist scholar knows, uh, be it about anti-black racism, anti-Jewish racism, or anti-Muslim racism. Uh, the more people don't have anything in their reality to do with these people who are seen as the other, the more they have prejudice against them. You can see that in a lot of quantitative data that um, supports this claim. In those more urban areas where you have larger populations of Muslim people, uh, you will find these prejudices existing, simply because the reality proves the prejudice to be wrong. Uh, which is a, we can discuss this a little bit more in de detail afterwards, but I think still it is uh, one important factor also that we can clearly see because when we speak about Hungary, Italy, Poland, those are countries where we speak about zero point something percent of Muslims living there. Whereas in Western Europe, we speak about, as we just said, saw between three to seven percent at this point of time. Now, obviously, this uh, sentiments are used by political parties. And this is a poll conducted, <coughs> conducted by the European Council on Foreign Relations, which shows that more than a fifth of voters of pro-European political parties see what they call Islamic radicals as the single biggest threat to Europe, while more than a quarter of the anti-European political parties, which is mostly the far right, share the same view. And one could also add that the idea of migration here very much also conflates with Muslims. So migration has to be thought of as Muslim migration in fact, in the context of Europe. Um, so I won't go into detail here regarding the chicken egg question, right? Is it the sentiment that was there, or is it like the political parties that introduced that kind of discourse in order to create that sentiment? We can have that discussion will be also there. I believe um, in, uh, in what I have studied uh, most of um, part of my political science career is the far right. Uh, and I believe that the drive, one of the main driving factors of anti-Muslim sentiments is the radical right. Parties on the right have increased their support tremendously within the last 20 years. And the current uh, radical right parties group um, identity and democracy, I believe here, today in the European Parliament has 73 mandates, all right, which is uh, something unthinkable, like if you go 50 years back, they were not even able to unify within one parliamentary group, that's how divided they were. And that also does not include a lot of far-right political parties that, uh, for instance, like the Spanish Vox or the uh, the Sweden Democrats or the Fratelli d'Italia, which uh, both in Sweden and, uh, and in, in Italy, they just have recently won tremendously in their elections. Fratelli d'Italia even um, being uh, the strongest party that will have the first ever far-right uh, prime minister of a Europe, Western European country, and Sweden the first time that we have them being the second strongest political party in Parliament. And those three parties, for instance, are not included in the IMD. They are part of the ECR, the European, European Conservatives and Reformists, which is kind of a centrist right, but leaning very much to the right. So we can see that there are a lot of political power now manifesting anti-Muslim policy claims um, in the political landscape of Europe. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because radical right political parties' central role in the dissemination of Islamophobia as an ideology, um, as one can see here with these images, um, is a very uh, important uh, way how to shape the general debate. Now, these are examples from Austria, Germany, Italy, France, uh, uh, and Switzerland. Um, you don't even have to know those languages to see how 
how much they resemble each other and how much they copy paste the different strategies. But what is important here is that the continuous uh, campaigning on these issues has really made the Islam issue, the so-called, what I would call the Muslim question, um, in, in ways that we have been discussing the so-called Jewish question. So while many observers are mentioning uh, the central role of Europe's right, uh, radical right political parties in the dissemination of negative views about uh, Muslims, one should not underestimate uh, the important role of institutionalized Islamophobia within the last few years that did not come from any nominal right-wing party, but rather from very centrist political parties, most often the centrist right, but also the centrist left social democratic parties who basically have co-opted the discourse of the radical right. So to give you uh, just like two examples here, some of you I'm sure have heard, and I know the New York Times writes a lot about France, so you are aware of Marine Le Pen, which is kind of the, the most famous and also successful far-right leader in France. Um, when she was debating the uh, back then, as I assume he still is, uh, the interior minister of Macron's government, which is kind of a centrist right government. Um, and she has like awful, like she was calling Muslims like the new Nazis who are invading France, like a very black and racist kind of discourse. So and during a, uh, uh, an election campaign, he uh, blamed her for being too soft on Islam. When he, she was saying, well, well we, we still have religious freedom. His answer was, well, you're too soft on the Muslims. And I think this is just like one of many examples that I could give to show you how much the anti-Muslim policy claims have really become mainstream politi uh, political positions nowadays. Another example which I give you here is from the chancellor of the country where I'm from, Sebastian Kurz, again a centrist right political leader, uh, who during the pandemic, well, when you might think like, okay, what, what, what do these people have problems with? You know, I mean, it's the pandemic, everybody's struggling basically to keep the society going. And he would say, well, we have to fight two challenges. First, the corona pandemic, and second, to fight even stronger against terrorism and radicalization in Austrian Europe. And radicalization and terrorism here is not used really for meaning like militancy or violence. It's used to frame like those Muslims who they are not happy with. All right? So, um, what do we do with all of that information in terms of the political landscape? Um, and I want, want to discuss now a little bit the institutional level of, uh, in Europe. So obviously there are some institution, institutions on a European level uh, that are aware of this. And the general leadership of the European project seems to be, I would say, quite unaffected by this worsening situation. To give you just like a few examples here. The European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI, which is part of the Council of Europe, uh, wrote in 2018 in a report that, quote unquote, in many, many member states, a dangerous normalization of Islamophobic prejudice can be observed, end quote. But one of the fundamental problems is that European institutions are more than reluctant to even recognize Islamophobia as a problem. And I'll give you here like two examples. Uh, one is the European Parliament, which adopted a resolution on combating anti-Semitism in 2017 uh, that includes very specific policy recommendations for the EU level as well as the national level. And the European Parliament also passed a resolu resolution to combat what they call anti-Gypsyism, which is basically about uh, the Roma uh, minorities uh, in Europe, again with very specific policy recommendations. But there is nothing akin to this regarding Islamophobia, right? And Muslim NGOs and anti-racist NGOs have tried like for years to have a similar resolution in place. Uh, but there is, it seems to be, a political unwillingness to comprehensively <coughs> and challenge Islamophobia on an institutional level. One positive step back in December 2015 was that, that an institution was created which was called the coordinator on anti-Muslim hatred, 
Now, the wording is interesting. Now, I'll come back to that. The problem with this institution was that uh, its main mandate was basically to address anti-Muslim hate speech, hate crimes, and discrimination. And there have been plenty of structural concerns before the new person was even nominated back in 2015. The main critique being that the position basically lacks a clear mandate as to what the role of the coordinator entails in terms of representation, official communication, and actions that he can undertake to also, also defining the remit of issues to be covered. And following the European Parliament elections in 2019, this position basically has, now has been void since the end of July 2021. Um, so even again, you see that there is a lack of, uh, of power behind that institution to really give it um, some life. And going back to the title, Coordinate on Anti-Muslim Hatred, it is very much about tackling something that is very personal, which draws again on what I said at the very beginning, the understanding of Islamophobia through the lens of prejudice studies. So, you define it as something like emotional, interpersonal, but not a structural problem that is might even be institutionalized in European nation states or in the European Union. So, in other words, there is a lack of understanding that Islamophobia is structural. Now, when this year the United Nations unanimously accepted a resolution uh, on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to declare 15th of March the International Day to Combat Islamophobia in commemoration of the Christchurch attacks where 51 people were killed in two mosques in New Zealand, the European reaction was actually quite interesting to observe. Now, on one hand, the resolution was unanimously accepted. But there were three speakers who basically contested the whole idea of having something like an international day to combat Islamophobia. So that was India. And I think I don't have to talk too much about why, uh, especially given you know, the, the more recent rise of the BJP there, of the Hindu nationalist um, outlook, were the killing of, and destruction of Muslim properties and lives has become uh, something that uh, is very normal. But it was also two other people. First of all, the representative of France, and secondly, the representative of the European Union, who explicitly expressed criticism of this resolution during the meeting. Um, although no, none of them opposed the resolution. The European Union, anyway, has only uh, an observatory status. But at least this shows us that there are major forces within Europe and especially countries like France that are investing less in the fight against Islamophobia and more um, into normalizing Islamophobia, as I would say. Um, I have been now the editor of this European Islamophobia report since uh, the 2015 edition, back in 2016. And if you look especially uh, into the last uh, two, can you see the link down? Uh, that's like islamophobiareport.com. You can download uh, those reports for free. Um, the last two reports were basically uh, emphasizing the institutional dimension that we have been seeing seen, uh, emanating in countries like France and Austria. That's why we put those two faces on the, on the cover. Emmanuel Macron, the President of the French Republic, and Sebastian Kurz, the Chancellor of Austria. Um, and I, I'll speak a little bit to that, why that is the case, and why that is also important on a European level. So today I would say I see two different movements at work in Europe when it comes to the state level. There are those who use Islamophobia to expand the authorities' power, to implement more authoritarian powers, and there are those who fight back against the alarmist discourse on alleged Islamization, the idea of the great replacement that we all know also from the white supremacist circles here in the United States. Now, I'll give you one example. Um, after a spate of violent attacks throughout Europe in the autumn of 2020, including the beheading of the French school teacher Samuel Paty and the shooting of four people in downtown Vienna, Austria, 
Several interior ministers issued a joint statement of solidarity against terrorism. And the first draft, which was authored by Austria, France, and Germany, included a lot of mentions of the religion of Islam. But it was significantly watered down in the final version due to the opposition coming from most of the other EU member states that did not really want to embrace this clash of civilization rhetoric on the EU, uh, on so-called EU values. So the final version included only one explicit mention of Islam and removed a proposal to sanction migrants, for instance, who refused to integrate. It called on EU member states to take, quote unquote, systematic action to prevent radicalization. However, countries supporting more hawkish policies regarding the surveillance of Muslims, such as Austria and France, did not give up at this point. They sell their Islamophobic politics, not like the far right, with a very Latin, ugly, anti-Muslim racist discourse, but rather present their Islamophobic policy claims as a means to defend liberal democracy. And, in a very colonial mindset, as saviors of the vast majority of peaceful Muslims. That's how they sell their product. Thus, they don't speak about being against Islam, but against what they call political Islam. So what is this political Islam? Um, I'll give you a few examples. There is one institution that was established on a European level, which is the Vienna Forum on Countering Segregation and Extremism in the Context of Integration. Uh, integration. That's how they call it. All right? That's a typical German way of how to put things very complicated. Um, so basically, the idea is here to have an annual conference uh, initiated in 2021 to intensify cooperation in the fight against what they call political Islam. So there were high representatives from Denmark, Sweden, France that participated, Austria, where it took place. Um, but what is political Islam? So in the name of fighting what the French government calls Islamist separatism, as French, uh, French uh, President Emmanuel Macron's government has legitimized, it cracks down on Muslim civil society organizations. Uh, the long-time secret systemic obstruction policy that has become public in, 20, uh, in late 2021 basically included that the French government ended uh, setting up 101 government units nationwide tasked with monitoring Islamic Muslims. You had a similar situation here after 9-11 when the New York Police Department also started spying on Muslims and campus that were organized, mosques, etc. Um, in the meantime, that has been going on since nobody knows for sure, but at least we uh, assume 2019, nearly 25,000 Muslim organizations and businesses were placed on secret blacklist and under strict monitoring. 718 Muslim-owned organizations and businesses were closed. At least four schools, 37 mosques, 200 businesses and two organizations um, were closed and 46 million euros. That's about like nearly the same amount of money in dollars have been seized as of January 2022. <coughs> Now, while the Ministry of Interior originally argued in favor of closing several civil society organizations, including uh, the Coordination Against Racism and Islamophobia, CRI, and the Collective Against Islamophobia in France, CCIF, on the grounds of supporting terrorism, later they were finally uh, uh, closed because the Council of State, which is like the legal institution, uh, it rejected the argument, but still it closed them because it confirmed uh, the, the official close on other grounds. Now, according to Macron's government in France and his government, this is what the fight against Islamist separatism was all about. It was for them, as they claim, protected by what they call Islamo leftism, Islamo gauchism, um, which is basically the alien of social science theories imported from the United States. What he basically means is post-colonial studies and anti-colonial discourse, um, which, according to him, divides the French nation. 
And therefore, the pushback was not only on Muslim institutions, it was very much also on a lot of critical social scientists and, and scholars who would speak truth to power, as you would call it here. Um, now, I will skip the part of Denmark and switch over to, um, to Austria, uh, where I come from and where I used to live up until like, a bit more than a year. Um, Austria, in, as a tradition in history, has actually a very tolerant accommodation of Islam and Muslims. It was one of the very few and one of the first um, countries in Western Europe that legally recognized Islam as a religion back in 1912 during the Habsburg times, when the monarchy was in place, two years before the World War I began. Um, but the new leadership of the Austrian government basically changed its course when it amended the Islam Act, included a new Islam Act, implemented a new Islam Act in 2015, that put the legally recognized Muslim institutions under heavy state control, and has implemented one legislation after the other targeting its Muslim residents and citizens. To give you a few examples, there was the full face whale ban in 2017, the 2018 ban of the hijab in elementary school, which was later revoked by the Constitutional Court. There were numbers of mosques that were closed, which again was revoked by the administrative courts, but you know, all of that takes like one year or more to happen. And all of these measures were legitimized by the argument that the government goes against so-called political Islam. So, although those measures were revoked later and found unlawful and discriminatory against Muslims, um, they show us what the fight against so-called political Islam was basically all about. Now, the EU's primary um, agency that helps to ensure that fundamental rights of people living in the EU are protected, which is the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, FRA, has in a recent report warned, uh, quote unquote, that discriminatory, uh, it has warned against discriminatory impact of counter-terrorism measures on specific groups, in particular Muslims, unquote. But what we can see in the governments of France and Austria is that this finds very little echo. And the Austrian government, to the contrary, continued to push for such policies um, and even started criminalizing um, political Islam, making it a criminal offense, although there is no legal definition of what political Islam really is. So there is not even a way for a court to evaluate, or quantify, or, 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 or judge um, what political Islam stands for. Therefore, they have also established institutions like the Documentation Center for Political Islam. Uh, one of those projects was basically to uh, create a map, the so-called Islam map, which was a digital map. You can find it online, uh, Islam Landkarte, which shows basically all of the existing 623 addresses of all mosques and Muslim associations existing in Austria. All right. So basically what that means is, if you're organized as a Muslim, you're political Islam, you're a threat, right? Um, so what has been called political Islam in Austria is what other policymakers have called legalistic Islamism in Germany, Islamist separatism in France. The main shared idea are twofold. First, that Muslims break the law or commit and, and not commit violence. And the argument is that Muslims use the law to subvert their European nation states. So once, if you are a Muslim and you want to participate in politics, that is deemed suspicious. Because you never know what are these people really behind. Do they have a plan to Islamize the country? So that's the talking points of the far right that the far right had introduced, and we see being institutionalized with these measures. So critique of these state policies then become an act of political Islam itself. And I give you here um, um, an example that of, I've already mentioned uh, for the case of France that two institutions that were, one was monitoring Islamophobia, the CCIF, and the other one uh, was, uh, was 
and of a social service institution that fought uh, like anti-Muslim racism. And they were closed down because it was said that their claim that the French state is committing institutional Islamophobia was a proof that these organizations basically are enemies of the state. That's how they were declared. But the reason for them being shut down was to be an enemy of the state. And the only, the only reason for that being there was they were criticizing the French government for doing that. Now in Austria, in one of the largest, uh, or their largest police raid happened in, in, the, the, in the Second Republic since 1945 was the so-called Operation Luxor, which was also uh, deemed uh, unlawful a year later. And that took place in, in, in November 22, uh, 2020, but it's still ongoing investigation. And this is taken from one of the files of this investigation. And here the Austrian intelligence service uh, argues that in the strategy papers for the establishment of a parallel state or caliphate, it is defined that a public discourse must take place by means of the term Islamophobia. For this reason, representatives of political Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood frequently use the term Islamophobia in the media. End quote. So basically, what I'm currently doing here for them would be a proof that this is political Islam and I would be a suspect of their terrorism investigation. All right? So basically, whoever speaks about Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism is a suspect of trying to establish this caliphate, becomes an enemy of the state, and is either a stupid enabler of Islamization on the political left, Islamo-Bushism, as the French government claims, or is himself a representative of political Islam. So that's how the picture is drawn. So and I'll give you like a few examples of how this discourse is substantiated by there is a huge knowledge production industry behind that that allows for these ideas to become mainstream and to enter the space of the bureaucratic order, uh, authorities in those uh, nation states. One proponent, for instance, a, a Muslim theologian, um, for, uh, was uh, during the inauguration of the Documentation Center Political Islam in Austria, would argue that political Islam is wrapped with a cloak of democracy while masking inwardly values. In other words, the accusation that Muslims deceive Western audiences by masking their true beliefs while presenting themselves as Democrats who will finally take control and Islamize European governments. So it's basically the great replacement theory in place, specifically um, coined to the Muslim issue. And the measures, laws, and attitudes uh, deem Muslims as guilty and until proven innocent, basically, and not the other way around, as it should be in any rule of law. Uh, um, political order. So in Austria and France, the crackdown on so-called political Islam has not targeted so-called extremists, <clears throat> but rather organized Muslims as well as critical voices. And I very often compare this to the institutionalization of a general demonization of political opponents by the infamous U.S. Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s, who had this witch hand of black and left-wing groups under the banner of anti-communism, which we all refer to as McCarthyism. In both cases, fundamental rights, such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, and in our case for Europe, in terms of Muslims, freedom of religion are basically under threat. Looking at these examples of Islamophobia in Europe thus reveals the heavy institutionalization to suppress Muslim community organizing, the critique of discriminatory state policies. And I think this is one of the bigger challenges within the European framework that we are facing today to combat Islamophobia. Although there are, at the very same time, many other forces who are trying hard to tackle institutionalized Islamophobia, especially within the NGO world, but also some European um, authorities 
not least ECRI, which I have mentioned, which just published a, um, a paper a couple of months ago, where it basically first time in the history of European institutions very explicitly embraced the idea that Islamophobia is a structural problem that has also to do with the whole anti-terrorism um, legislations and the way how European nation states deal with their Muslim constituencies. A lot of that is obviously also supported from politicians of color who are pushing back against that or who are trying to push back. They are not that like that, like, that kind of strong to really have a say in changing fully the paradigm, but I see that there are measures being taken in order to com combat these developments. All right, I will stop here because I think I have spoken more than long enough, and I do hope that we're going to have an interesting discussion following this. Thank you so much for your attention. an opportunity for anyone to ask any questions and if you would please this is being filmed so if you can please come up to the microphone and speak in the microphone so that everybody can hear you um, and I'd like to let the students come up first. And if you don't have a question, I have a question. Alright, I'll start. I feel like that warm up the room a little bit. So I have a question. We've made some comparisons between what we're seeing in the United States and what we're seeing in Europe. And I was wondering, now that you've been in the U.S. now for a few months, right, for the first day of Williams College, what are some specific things that you can say are similar or different in the treatment of Muslims when we talk about Islamophobia in the U.S. versus Europe? Well, thank you. Um, very good question. Well, first of all, I think one of the major fundamental differences is obviously that for a lot of uh, European nation states, they, they consider themselves to be strong states. Okay, so the nation state, the idea of the nation state is also very much related to the idea of the welfare state, uh, although it's eroding, but still it is existing. And it's, it's the, take, the, the caring state, right? The idea here, what I feel is, you know, the, 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 the the relationship between the citizen and the nation state is more of like the constitution should protect us from the, the federal government. While the idea in Europe is very much that the, the father state takes care right, of, of the citizen. So one of, one of the aspects of this uh, relationship, you could also put it in a very different way of how the state relates to religious institutions. While separatism and secularism in the U.S. context, broadly speaking, means that there is a, a, a very strong separation between the state institutions and the churches and religious denominations, the state-church relationship in Europe is very different. So you have, I mentioned this briefly, legal recognitions of churches and other religious communities, which means that the nation-state relates to churches and religious denominations as a partner in several policy fields. To give you an example, countries like Austria, Germany, and others have religious education. If you're a follower of Catholicism, you will get to go to public school, you have Catholic lessons from a Catholic priest or Catholic trained teacher, right? So there are, uh, it's the conception of how collective religious freedom is seen is like a wholly different. And that has a very important implication, because the implication is that the state, since he has a direct contact to the church leadership or the religious denomination leadership, he can also deal with that religion. Therefore, there are many policies put in place, and the interesting thing now is with Muslims is, while in very often in European nation states, it is a cultural the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, 
that deals with the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church and other religious minorities, there is a trend within the last 15 years that for Muslims, it's not the Ministry of Cultural Affairs, it's the Ministry of Interior. And you know what that implies. You're a threat. We, we got to take care that this place stays a secure one. So the lens of that the European nation state in governmental terms takes is approaching the Muslim issue as a security question. Not as a question of corporate religious freedom compared to other religious institutions, but a wholly different one. And I think that already lays the ground for a very different institutional approach by state authorities vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim minorities. That's one thing. The other thing um, I think which is very important is, and I, I know, I mean, I've talked with so many of my American friends here about that, and I remember when Trump was inaugurated, I was, at that time in California, and people were freaking out, saying, like, we have to leave that country, it's becoming so awful. I say, look, there is a difference. You might have somebody like Trump. But the difference to Europe is, we have a lot of Trumps. Nobody cares. We accept the Trumps being Trumps. Whereas, and I think that has a lot to do with the history of slavery, the civil rights movement, and the empowerment of ethnic minorities, and so on and so forth. You do have in the United States what I see, this idea of we can talk in the public about racism. If you go to a German-speaking country where I'm from, if you say, if you call Islamophobia anti-Muslim racism, that already would create such a huge pushback because the idea is after 1954, 45, after the end of the Holocaust and the Nazi regime, we entered a time and space of equality where race is no more an issue. The colorblind country, that's through self-imagination. So in other words, what I would say is, and I know you have similar discourses here and there too, I'm aware of that, but there is a huge population that is able to speak about race relationships and in a historical perspective and racism. And we don't have that, I would say, in most of continental European society. It's just not existing. I mean, I could tell you about so many things that I have encountered in my life. Like, just to give you like one example, the director of the um, Center for Antisemitism Studies in uh, in Berlin, Germany. Uh, when he retired, he gave a speech, basically saying that, you know, um, a lot of what we're seeing today going on with the Muslims. Very reminiscent of what we have seen with antisemitism. And this was a guy who was working at this position like for decades. I mean, he, I think he published like 25 volumes of a yearbook of on antisemitism studies. And he was like publicly lynched, right? After that. Which I think shows you that there is really very, very few space for having these kinds of debates. And to give you just one example about like how, how, how often you will see that anti-Semitism parallels Islamophobia. As a political scientist who has studied Austrian politics, you know, Karl Riga, who is the most famous mayor of Vienna, historically speaking, and was one of the big anti-Semites, a great teacher of Adolf Hitler, he once said the slogan, Vienna shall not become Jerusalem. A hundred years later, we have the far right saying, Vienna shall not become Istanbul. Mm -hmm. Istanbul referring to the largest group of Muslims of Turkish origin in Austria. And still you don't have that debate. You know what that means? About how impossible or how difficult it is? Yeah. That's just an example. Hi. Um, so I just want to raise um, Thank you. 
Can you repeat the question? Okay. Oh. My, I, don't, I don't think the mic is on. The mic is on. So you need to get closer. Oh, speak into the mic. Please. Okay. Um, so, compared to like small religions like North Korean religions, like you see it here in Europe and that kind of thing, how do people treat it compared to like um, like Islam? Like, are they, do they receive that kind of treatment for it here when they kind of treat it as an outsider in their hands or like religious? Or how they treat it. Okay, I mean, um, I can tell you from what I have studied myself um, in terms of religious minorities in countries like Austria or Germany. Usually, those religious communities try to get the same privileges as the dominant churches, which is most often the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. So their aim is uh, to get the same pri privileges, get legal recognition, and therefore um, be able to have like a public appearance. So in a way, they try to also get like this kind of contract with the state. So I think the nation state's interest in that is that the more he can relate to these religious institutions, the more he can control it. Because that system is not a new one. It's not like a post-fascist uh, system that was introduced, that's going back to the monarchy's time, in the case of Austria, 1878, the recognition law, etc. That was the time, you know, the monarchy has a different ra rationality when it relates to its citizens. It has even, not even this notion of citizen that we have in a democracy. So that, that's the case, which is not necessarily something bad, because um, if you pay your taxes and the state takes care also of religious needs, you might think that this is something that is helpful. I mean, I'm very suspicious because I think the question of control is always there. Even though, legally speaking, uh, these religious institutions have an autonomy, so they can do whatever they want, basically, and the state is not allowed to interfere, but that's not what we see when it comes to the Muslims. It's also the case with other minorities, let's say the Jehovah's Witness, for instance. The states are also very suspicious, and therefore they try everything to make it possible to not give them the proper place that other, uh, other religions, like dominant churches, enjoy. Hi. Uh, I was wondering what you think the best way to approach this issue is for more far-right groups, because <clears throat> for more open-minded people, talks like this are great, but I almost feel like this is another similarity to the kind of great replacement that you alluded to, where the very far-right people, the stronger you tackle this issue, the more rooted their fears are going to be. They're going to go, oh, yeah, they are trying to subvert us in some way. So, like, what do you think the best way to approach the far-right uh, groups about this kind of topic is and how to discuss it? Let's differentiate between two kind of far right. I have debated far right politicians for all my life. And I know them also intimately. I mean the place I grew up and I was was born and socialized in my early youth. I told it uh, to Carolyn, uh, my best friend's father was a far right leader, the most prominent far right leader in the whole state. So honestly it doesn't, I think it does not matter. Because I, for a very long time, I was always like, give everybody his own place in the society. And be fair, no matter if you agree or not agree. But I think throughout the last 10, 15 years, one of the things that I have learned is that it makes pretty few sense to have a conversation, a meaningful one. Because there are different interests. If you believe that your race should not be replaced and people of color have no place in your society, there is not much space left. I think, though, 
a lot of the people who vote for him and who are not the rank and file of these political parties and movements, I would always sit and have a coffee with them and relate to them and talk about the anxieties that I believe these people have planted into their minds. And I think um, creating spaces where people come together and share their experiences is always good. And I, I would never withdraw from such an offer. But honestly, with the leadership, I, I came at least to a point, due to my experience, that it does not really make a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Hi, I just want to know what you think when you mention about population um, in Muslims in Europe. What do you think about whether you know the policies, um, the security, how it's increasing? Do you think there will be more Muslims in Europe, or will there be a massive decrease? And what's your impact on future members of Muslims in Europe? That's a very good question, um, and I don't have like a clear answer to that, but I'll give you like different observations. In in Germany, where um, the majority, as I said, of um, Muslim people is like roughly a half of the Muslim population is of Turkish origin, um, you will see that a lot of them are actually uh, left Germany. Uh, a lot of them who are like born in Germany, but they have Turkish ancestry, so they have good education because of the institutional discrimination they face, they opt for leaving. Germany because they have better opportunities outside. Um, and if you compare immigration and immigration regarding Germany and Turkey especially, you will see that there are more people who go to Turkey. Um, that was at least before the economic crisis happened in Turkey. Okay, so the, the numbers are a bit older. But I think that shows you a tendency that younger folks who are better educated they might not see their future in those countries. At the very same time, that also means something, because if the higher educated are those who leave, it's the working class who stays. Okay? It's those who have no vision in the society, who cannot afford to go somewhere else. Right? Like myself. I, I can go to a university here, but not every uh, like Muslim background Austrian can do that. Um, so that could also create an interesting dynamic. And I can see that clearly in France. I have another colleague on campus who is from Belgium. He said, I can't live there anymore. And he's an, an economist, and he has to, in the university, he had to uh, see, sign a document saying that he's not against the secular laicity of France. He said, what do I have to do? I, I teach economics. But the reason that he is read as a Muslim, as a brown person, as a North African, which is why he's put into this position. Now, I think there are two different strategies on the right, how they want to handle this. There is the far right that basically says, let's shake those people out of the country, imagining that they are non-citizens, which is not the case for roughly half of the people. The other half, yeah, they could choose. They could do that, but they make the citizen regime even more restrictive. And then there is the centrist right. The centrist right is not saying definitely, we're going to kick you out. They're saying, we're going to change you. You want to fit in? We're going to set up departments of theology where we're going to teach you what Islam we're going to want you to believe in. That kind of different, you know, creating this homegrown Muslim, German Islam, that is actually the main goal of the ministries of the interior. Wherever you look, Italy, France, Germany, Wherever they, you go, you will see their idea is creating a German Islam, an Italian Islam, a French Islam, which is basically implying that if you are a Muslim, having your own understanding about your religion, you are potentially a threat. If you have transnational cooperation, you are a threat. What we want you is a disciplined Muslim subject within the national framework. That's the end product of the centrist right and some centrist left. Now, what's the options for the Muslims? There are many. But yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Very important question. Um, I was curious on sort of you showed some examples of how media in America shows um, Muslims, but in the United States, when touching on real world, world issues such as um, what's happening in Iran right now, I've been noticing like a little less on talking about those issues when in comparison to what is happening in other countries similar to that. And I was curious how that's portrayed in Europe, if there's sort of an unconscious prejudice or bias against talking about um, Iran or Iraq or when there's certain issues um, that are more global. Yeah. I mean, the images that I showed were very much from election campaigns from far-right folks themselves. So it was not like the media that had these kinds of portrayals. But um, if you look into the communication science literature, you will clearly see that uh, the, the way how Muslims are being covered by media, especially when it comes to foreign policy issues, and there is a lot of studies on that, you clearly see the tendency, like Islam is related to violence, terrorism, etc. So there is a strong conflation. At the very same time, I see also that there is much more, like over the time, you find more nuanced ways of dealing with it. Like, let's take the Iran issue, for instance. And I, I was asked this, like, last week when I gave a talk somewhere, um, on the question of, uh, like, is, you know, this protest of Iranian women against the hijab, is that Islamophobic? I was saying, no, I mean, this is, like, this is about state power. That, that is the very same thing that I'm criticizing in European countries. In France, you know, they tell them you are not allowed to wear the hijab in this government, which is more authoritarian, tell them you have to. So the struggle is basically the same. That is not Islamophobia. But obviously, you can see here and there, people use it for their own gains, as anybody will do. Um, if you look into the political landscape, so yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I just I'm going to pivot a little bit. I just have a you mentioned a couple of times that there were different kinds of conversations and both examples you used had to do with Jewish spaces, um, where there were the opportunities or possibilities to think differently. Um, and so I was curious about that. Um, because for example, in France I know that um, like there's a swath of Jews who are like identifying, you know, <laughs> way too much with the police and secularity, but it's really a position that's anti Islam. It's not an anti Muslim and anti immigrant. It's not actually a huge embrace of secularity from my perspective. Um, and then there are other French uh, leaders, especially I would say in um, sort of secular but Jewish spaces, who are opening up to the kinds of conversations you were um, mentioning. So I'm curious about that. Where are the spaces um, in which the, the, the conversation is um, about historicizing Islamophobia, I guess, making that easier? Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, there is a lot of great scholarship on that, and there are people who are writing about it. Honestly, I, th I see that much, much more happening in the States than in Europe. And I think there is a reason for that, because like, if you want to get uh, research funded uh, that discusses these issues, it's much, much more problematic. Just because the idea is, I mean, I think, first of all, there is this political climate in which never again is, uh, is a pillar of post-war European society. So never again means what? Like, the Holocaust never again. But in, in fact, I would argue, and to put it very I mean, in a bit of a reduced way, but it means don't do anything bad to the Jews again. Because when you look at like what is going on, be it with Jewish communities, but also with Muslims and other minorities, and Roma, etc., you will see that there are many problems that should be a reminder of, of bad times. But I think politically, especially in the German-speaking countries, I would argue where I come from, but on a broader level, I think that's very true for a lot of continental European countries. 
I think that is the case. Um, so yes, you have those spaces, you have them in academia, far away from the public. Um, but once you want to you, you want to have that discussion in the, in the public, you can be sure that there is going to be a huge, huge, huge shift uh, pushback. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is really so of the recent uh, incidents in Iran. So there's over uh, 50 Muslim countries. Most people don't know that, but um, that's like one fourth of the entire world's countries. And only one or two of them mandate the hijab. And there's like over a dozen countries that actually ban the hijab in some form, including Muslim countries, including Egypt. And it happens in Canada, it happens in every continent. So why is there such a focus on in this one country that's Islamic and there's like dozens of countries that um, actually ban the hijab? Is that the reason for that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I would even go far. On. I mean, I once did a book um, in Islamophobia, Muslim Majority Society, where we actually looked at like and the history of that um, in those countries where the majority of the society is has a Muslim background, and even when. And speaking about what I was just talking about, like this kind of state control over religion, that's very much like a colonial heritage of the newborn nation state following colonialism, but also of the monarchies um, in the Gulf states, etc., where they actually use religion for their own purpose, right? So um, it is interesting to see also like a lot of European leaders, um, Angela Merkel to Sebastian Kurz and others. If you look at uh, when they meet, meet up with uh, leaders from those Muslim majority countries, like Egypt, like the UAE, or other countries, and what they talk about is so called bad political Islam. And also, the way how they give them, like the, those Muslim country leaders, give them recommendations of um, how they should treat their Muslims. More state control. I mean, these, these are most of the cases, most of the cases, super authoritarian regimes, right? The funny thing is, you know, a Western democracy still looks at itself as a liberal democracy. But but when it comes to that issue, uh, there is nothing left of liberal democracy. But it's really these authoritarian state structures that they import, actually, I would argue, from those countries. And, uh, there is a lot of lobbying in Brussels going on uh, around this issue, but there is also, um, I think, this intellectual exchange from Muslim majority countries. I know that does not necessarily speak explicitly to your question, but I just want to problematize like, you know, this issue is a, the question of anti-Muslim racism, Islamophobia, is a question of power. That's what it is at the heart. It's not really about Islam. I believe, if you know, if the majority of Western European countries are inhabited by Muslims, those far-right leaders would become Muslims first, right? For them, it's not about, it's, the question is not Islam. Islam is the project surface, the projection surface of that. Um, so the, the problem is really that post-war Europe was, was constructed on the basis that political parties, the largest ones, should share powers. That's what made post-war Europe for the first three decades in most countries. Social Democrats on the one side, Conservatives on the other side. You know, then this was questioned in the 80s with Green parties, far right parties coming into the game. And now with the immigration of a lot of Muslim people, especially in the 60s, 70s, the question is what is their place? All right, because they, like to give you an example, I come from Vienna, the capital city of Austria. People who are officially so called have a so called migration background, which is basically means, by definition, at least one of your parents is born outside of Austria. It's kind of a people of color category. More than 50% of the whole population belongs to this group. If you look at the Viennese Council, that has 100 MPs, you may have three out of 100. So you see the huge gap in the question of representation, and that is what this whole thing is all about. The fear of the centrist right, why they are implementing all of these tools, to threaten and manage their Muslim constituency is because they want to keep the power, they don't want them to share power and to have anything to say regarding how the future of this country should look like. So, in 
in many ways, that is also, I think, very similar to what we have with the post-colonial elites of the nation states uh, in a lot of Muslim countries who believe that they have a certain specific authoritarian liberal perspective um, that has, has to be in place and that has been supported by U the U.S. and many other um, stronger countries because they, for them, the way they put it is, it allows them for stability and, and clarity. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that presentation, for uh, all of the different ideas that, that come out of this place that we need to study further. Um, I want to talk about a little bit institutionalization. The examples you gave us of the institutionalization of Islamophobia are at the same level. Um, you talked a little bit about sort of the EU institutional uh, setting and the tiny little steps that go maybe to take. Um, but the EU clearly has a mandate to try to implement those liberal ideals within all member states. So it's the balance between sort of what the states are doing and what the EU can do, or the possibilities for the EU and the EU institutions to be able to do things similar to the anti-Semitism initiatives and others. Um, not, part of your talk has already given us, I think, some of the answer, that there's not the EU or the EU uh, parliament or the European parliament like this, so the political will might not be there. But what are the institutional possibilities given the structure um, that we are dealing with? Yeah, I think that's a good question. <laughs> Since we are so far away, I mean, in reality from that, um, I mean, I have not been involved so much in the policy making process of uh, European institutions, but I have to some extent like, worked with the former coordinator and the Muslim Book of the Second. So, um, I always felt like one of the first steps for them, and for a lot of the NGOs that were fighting Islamophobia on the European scale, was always like this, we need a definition of Islamophobia, we need a resolution to fight Islamophobia, similar to the resolution fighting anti-Semitism. Um, and I think, um, we spoke about the political unwillingness, um, and I think if something like that would be and I think the, the Council of Europe already did something with, because they published at the beginning of this year, uh, ICRI, uh, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance, they uh, published a paper where they gave clear recommendations. One of the things, for instance, is that a lot of European nation states have what they call the Action Plan Against Racism, which is, uh, has been implemented in some places and others not. That would be a possibility, and they, they recommended that, that every nation state should very explicitly also include anti-Muslim racism as a structural problem. One of the things was really about the terminology that were used, because as long as they spoke about anti-Muslim hatred, it was like, okay, you know, hatred, yeah, as I said before. But if you recognize it as a structural problem, you also have to do something. The other thing, which also we, I remember we criticized that back in 2016, that a lot of European countries do not even uh, have anti-Muslim hate crime as part of a specific hate crime. Meanwhile, in 2017, the Republic of Germany has included them, and several others too. So in order to be able to quantify the problem, to some extent at least, we always know as a FRA, uh, uh, study has shown only 12% of people who um, have been discriminated amongst Muslims do report that at police or other institutions. But still, that is a mechanism that allows you to make that visible, right? So that would be another possibility, another venue, how to uh, give that more institutional recognition. And I think, I think the ECRI recommendation was to understand the very good. 